Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Mentor Talk, the unique destination for insightful conversations with experienced professionals. I'm your host, Suzette, the CEO of Sales Pro for You, and more about me during this episode. So, without uh, further delay, I would like to start today's uh, Mentor Talk together with um, Gregory Tain. I hope I pronounced this uh, correctly, Greg. Close. <laughs> <laughs> close so um yeah i'm so grateful that you are uh, today in the in the mentor talk because um i made some uh, let's say short research about your background and i am really really impressed because uh, you have more than uh, 45 years of uh, experience uh, in business and as a mentor for businesses operating in energy corporate finance, market research, real estate, advertising, and the fintech sectors. And also, you are having a proven expertise in handling mergers, acquisitions, and fundraising. So I hope this is, you know, you in a nutshell. But uh, obvious, it would be really nice if you can just, you know, speak a bit about your, your path, what you have achieved in the last um, decades. So, Greg, please. Okay, well, that was a pretty good attempt to give a short overview of what I've done. Um, but I really started when I was 16 in business. So I've done a lot more things um, over the years. But what that gives me is a vast experience and an experience that wasn't just in England. It was also in Russia, in Asia, in Australia. I had a year in America and so on. So I think one of my real pluses is the range of experience and the range of industries that I understand. So when you speak about range, what does this mean in detail? Because uh, I think you you got your, or your, you grow your expert, expertise in different sectors, right? So in different markets, in different regions. So maybe you can, you know, elaborate a bit about this Okay, I'll try and give you a quick overview. At 16, I had a choice. Uh, I was in a secondary school in Tunbridge Wells, England, and I got a few O-levels and I was given the choice. I could go to the grammar school where I had to wear a uniform or I could go to Maidstone College where I could wear jeans. So the answer is obvious. I went to Maidstone College. Now, Maidstone College at that time was or had the largest capacity for concerts and dances. The regulations weren't strictly enforced and you could get two or 3,000 people into a concert. I was at Maidstone literally for three months and I was making friends with all the union because my parents had taught me how to play cards properly. I was playing cards with them every day and they made me social secretary when the current social secretary got fired. Now, I think they made me social secretary so they could steal all the money or at least take some of it. But what happened is over the next two years, I ran some very big dances uh, with 2,000, 3,000 people every night. And I was totally responsible for everything, for the money, for the bar, for the security. The security came from Maidstone Prison. And there are bands that even some of your younger uh, listeners might know. Uh, we had Electric Life Orchestra one weekend. We had Rory Gallagher, one of the best guitarists around. We had the German band Hawkwind, one of the, the very first, I think, electronic band. And we had Fleetwood Mac and so on. So that was a very good introduction to business. So from being a promoter, um, I then worked a few weeks at the Virgin Agency in London, booking bands. We were looking after Henry Cow, Gong, uh, Mike Oldfield hadn't helped, ha happened yet. Um, but over that period, I decided that I'd start a number of magazines. So we started music magazines. At the time, radio had just started in England uh, before the year before there'd only been one or two radio stations, local radio had started. And we started a magazine called Radio and Record News, which told all the record industry what was happening. 
So that was the start of many years in publishing. Um, from the radio and record magazines, then moved on to video. Video just started. Most people, you know, video is an old fashioned machine. Your parents probably have it. Uh, you put a big tape in. Uh, you probably started with CD discs. But anyway, video, when I, when I started the magazines, what video and then popular video, which were sold all around the country, um, were telling people whether they should buy Betamax or VHS or Sony because it was a big expenditure then and, and quite expensive. But the music magazines... The video magazines, one of the problems we had is we sold the advertisements, but we didn't often get paid. Quite often people reneged on, on the contract. Uh, we didn't want to go to the courts. It was too expensive. So we looked around and thought, what can we do where we will like the customers and they'll pay the bills? And so we started a whole range of financial magazines. So what was... Uh, 40 years ago, getting a mortgage was a big deal. It would take you six months to get an appointment with the bank manager. You'd have to buy a new suit, wear a tie, go with your wife and, you know, ask very, very politely for a mortgage. So we started What Mortgage Magazine, uh, which is still running electronically. Uh, after a year, we started What Investment Magazine, after I think three or four years, we had 15 financial titles and we went on the London Stock Exchange on the junior, junior market. So that was that was publishing. Um, you've got to remember that before internet and before your mobile phone, uh, publishing was where you got information. Magazines, there were very big magazine sales and you would be supplying a lot of information to people that they couldn't get elsewhere unless they went to the the library, spent a, a week in the library digging through books and manuals. So that's just a tiny bit of the early years. From there, um, I went on to create the British Investors Database where I computerized every share register in the main market in London. We literally created a database of 10 million people who had invested in the stock exchange. We did that by getting printouts of all the share registers, flying them to India, recomputerizing them and bringing them back. When I came up with the idea, people said the companies will never give me the share registers, but it was in the law. They had to give it to me. We had a couple of fights, but eventually everybody had to give us the share registers. Uh, we then ended up with a database that had all the names and addresses and investments at one point in time of all the investors in the United Kingdom. And when the government was floating all the companies and making all the um, state-owned companies private, like the electricity, the gas and everything, every time they did a flotation, they'd buy all the data off us at I think it was over a million pounds every time, which 30 years ago was a lot of money. So that company was called ICD. That again was on the stock market. We then went on to do uh, the British Consumer Survey, where we got 7 million people in the United Kingdom to fill in a very detailed eight page survey. Um, at the same time, I was active in politics with the Conservative Party. I was on the list to be a candidate for the European Parliament. I was being paid as a consultant where I was working with them on how to win the next election. Um, and I was focusing on the marginal seats and, and running some very new marketing techniques across those those. Uh, those areas. So in 1992, I got invited by a friend who I'd used to employ to go to Russia. And I went to Russia, 1992 was really the first year that Moscow opened up. And I just couldn't believe how nice it was when I got there. Uh, early on, it was very nice, very friendly. And 
I previously, a few years earlier, had had a, a, a pretty um, tough divorce. So when I got to Russia and it was so nice and there was a party every night, to be honest, uh, I decided I was going to stop what I was doing in the United Kingdom and go to Russia and start business in Russia. So within a few months, I'd resigned from running a public company. I'd taken the money I'd created and a few investors uh, backed me with a little bit of money. I went to Russia and we started up four or five different businesses. Rick, can I just ask you a question about, you know, setting up the company in Russia? So how did you prepare yourself to just, you know, doing this? Because it's a completely other mentality. Of course, I mean, it was in 1992, you know, as you just, as you said, you know, the, the wall was down, everything was now going to be open. You could start traveling, you know, every, there was also a big change, you know, from the politics, right? So how did you prepare yourself and did you were... Uh, aware of the language as well, because Russian, English, you know? Niet, chuchu paruski. I speak very little Russian, even though I, my second wife is Russian, we're still happily married. And uh, I think all through life, I've got a philosophy that you just have to do it. If you've got a good idea, you just have to do it. Um, coming back to what I told you about the beginning, Uh, what investment magazine, what mortgage magazine. W.H. Smith's at the time sold 50% of all the magazines in the country. They had a chain of retail outlets all over the country. And it took me about six or seven months to talk them into understanding that people would buy what mortgage. I had to go and do research, but I, I believed in the idea. I knew it would work. I knew from talking to people and researching the area that people were really struggling to get mortgages. They were frightened of it. And while they'd probably only buy two or three months worth of magazines, they'd probably only buy it until they actually got a mortgage, um, there was a continuous flow of customers. So as, a, as, a, as an economic business, it was going to be uh, sustainable. Uh, I think a British Investors Database, I knew I was correct on the law. I had My my degree was in law. I had one year in Lincoln's Inn at Leighton's uh, solicitors thinking of becoming an article clerk. Uh, so I had a, a reasonable assumption, uh, idea of the law. Um, and you just had to fight. You know, if you believe in an idea, you have to fight. And you have to, of course, you have to think about the economics, think about your costs, do, do, do a budget understand where the income is going to come from, understand where the consumers or the customers are going to come from. But if you have a good idea, you've just got to push it. Now, really, Russia, I just wanted to go there. I had missed out by one or two years when I was younger. Um, I didn't go to Woodstock and I didn't go to the Isle of Wight. So I'd missed out on the two big hippie um, conferences. <laughs> <laughs> you can call them conferences. Mm -hmm. and, and in 1992, <laughs> early years in Russia, it was the same again. It was just unbelievably good fun and exciting. You know, you'd be talking to people. You know, there's so much bad news about Russia at the moment and, 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 and so much negativity. But in the early years, you'd sit there late at night talking about Tolstoy or Dostoevsky or about saving the world while drinking very dodgy um, drinks because uh, all the dodgy drinks in the world were sold in Russia by that time. In later years, they got the good wine and the, and the good spirits, but you'd be drinking very, very strange concoctions. Uh, but we just went and we could, it was obvious there were no businesses uh, of a Western standard. So th there were two themes, uh, you know, marketing, research, Advertising, I understood very well. That's what I've been doing. We started businesses in that area. But on top of that, there was no business cards. This is the day before computers, before phones, you needed business cards. So we bought a printing press. No idea how to run it. We bought a printing press, imported it to Russia, a simple ABDIC printing machine, 
and we uh, we set up as printers as a kind of cool quick or you know, instant print shop. So we're printing business cards, we're printing letterheads, we're doing quite well. We had one competitor. But unfortunately, the only printer we could find to print regularly for us and work for us came from the old Soviet system. And he used to genuinely print with one hand because the other hand had a bottle of vodka. Um, so normally it took us three or four attempts to, um, to, to print a business card correctly. So we only did this for a few months and, and it was clear that we, we, you know, it wasn't a business for us. So we, we sold it to the competitors very quickly. And that's another thing in business. If something's not working, you've got to realize that and, and cut your losses. Um, the uh, second strange business we did was there was no, for all the foreigners and lots of foreigners were coming in, uh, we set up a medical insurance company where we we uh, negotiated with a head doctor at Polyclinic Number 1, I think it was, just at the end of Tereskaya. And we had 30 doctors who had reasonable English skills who were going to go out at you know midnight or two in the morning to, um, to save the expats and the foreigners who, who didn't know how to get to a Russian hospital or didn't have access to the system. So that went quite well, except the doctors you know, just wouldn't listen to us. We were worried about having a proper system. So we wanted the doctors to fill in forms, tell us what they'd gone, done, what drugs they prescribed, what they'd given. I mean, we were literally buying drugs in London, flying them British Airways, you know, uh, in, in a couple of suitcases and, and bringing them to Moscow. And again, we struggled with that for a year. Um, I had an investor in that, a partner who was a director of one of the major insurance companies in the world. And after almost a year, we decided the doctors were never going to listen to us. And one day we're going to have a big problem. Nobody had died or had any serious accident from us. I think our total investment was something like $80,000 by this stage. Uh, and we were kind of making money, but we just gave it to the doctors. It was clear they were never going to listen to us. Uh, so we gave it to the doctors. Now, on the other side, on the marketing and the market research business, within three years, had the biggest market research company in Russia uh, called the Russian Market Research Company, RMRC. Um, we had offices in 22 uh, cities in Russia. I was Those were the days when you had to have a stamp to visit a city. And I was one of the few people who could travel around and with my very, very limited Russia, I often used to travel by myself because I believe if you're positive, it's always possible. You know, people do speak English, even in France. Um, you know, you just <laughs> to smile at them. And if the worst comes the worst, you get your American Express card out and show them that and then they improve. Um, so the market research company, uh, I think at one stage had 200, 200 plus people working for it. We were working for all the main Procter & Gamble, Unilever, people like that. And ultimately, we sold that to GFK, the uh, German market research company. The advertising business we started uh, went on to become the biggest advertising business at Rush in Russia for one stage. Um, it, we built it up, and by the time we had... Um, got just uh, 2007, we we're on the London Stock Exchange, we we're on the Swedish Stock Exchange, dual listing. We had offices in Kiev, we had offices in Almaty. In total, we we're in 18 different countries, all emerging markets. And then basically the 2008 crisis just destroyed the business. People forget how bad it was. Most businesses in places like Romania, we had a nice business in Romania, 100 people, we would gain working for, because our positioning was always, we, we are European standard, we are, we are decent, we're mid-priced, um, we, we, you can rely on us. But um, in Romania, for example, Genus Procter & Gamble cancelled all their contracts with us, Unilever cancelled, they all closed their offices. In Russia, they hung on a bit longer because their investment was bigger. 
but many of our businesses went from 100 or 200 staff to 10 or 15. Oh. So ultimately, we decided to sell everything. And I spent three years selling everything. Uh, so from a height of, of uh, being on two stock exchanges, looking like we're going to make a lot of money, 9,000 people over 18 countries, uh, we sold everything by the end of 2012. So uh, much more up to date, uh, last five years or so, I've completely f focused on renewable energy. And we are now um, in a process where we have purchased two geothermal wells in Holland, and we have applied to drill 24 more geothermal wells. Geothermal well, you drill down just the same as oil or gas, two kilometers, three kilometers, up to six kilometers into the ground. Mm -hmm. You hit hot water. You bring the water up and you use the water um, to heat homes, to uh, provide energy to industry. Um, a very good example is to provide heat to um, greenhouses. And there's a lot of growing of, of vegetables and salad and tomatoes in greenhouses. In Holland, there's 110 square kilometers of greenhouses. Um, the business, which is called 85 Degrees, which I started with my partner, Bart Doonhai, who's a, a Dutch citizen. Um, we, we genuinely believe that within four years, maybe five years, we'll be a, a, a billion euro business. Unfortunately, I've only got a very small um, shareholding, but it's still going to be worth quite a lot. <laughs> Hopefully it's going to be a bit like Google. Um, because to fund things like this, you've got to get other investors on board and you've got to give your shares away and your equity away. So we're looking to do exactly the same in Germany. You, you as you're based in Germany, you'll know that many of your cities have heat networks and all the heating of water, getting your hot water, getting your radiators. And then also, it, you know, heat will also drive air conditioning. Um, so you can air condition from the heat as well. And then if the water is warm enough, you can generate electricity above about 120 degrees, 130 degrees is efficient at generating electricity. So that's the main thing I'm focusing on at the moment. Thank you so much, Greg. So pff, I'm so impressed, you know, I just looking for words. <laughs> but yeah, so I would like maybe to ask two questions. Could you give an advice? What or how should advertising or PR done? Um, I think the whole world of advertising and marketing is completely and utterly changing. Um, I always tend to be a number of years in front. Uh, I think 15 years ago, I was saying television is dead and television now is, is dead. I mean, maybe we watch the news a bit and we watch about a comedy or some series, but really everybody's absorbing from Netflix and, and Apple TV and, and other things. So I think what you're moving to is an area where people want to communicate one-to-one. -one. They don't want the mass efforts. They don't want the TV commercial. You know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the top paid person in an ad agency was the creative director. And he'd sit there all day having genius ideas or all, all week or all year. And as long as he had one, one fantastic idea that, um, you know, worked really well and won all the television awards and made more sales for his, his, his business, um, he, he, he kept his job <laughs> and got a salary increase. Um, I think that's all changed. And it's now about communicating one-to-one. -one. Um, and if you look at all the tools, uh, you know, we worked through the emergence of computers. When I started business, it wasn't even, there wasn't any, there weren't even electronic typewriters. Electronic typewriters came maybe two or three years into my work life. Uh, you know, people were typing on manual typewriters in the lawyers when I worked there. Um, and 
people are so attached now to their telephone you get so much information from your telephone you don't need to read a map anymore you use the map or app on most most people can on the telephone but the iphone i think is only 13 years old it really is not very old so technology is changing technology is moving very very quickly um people don't like change but i think in the world of advertising and pr it's it's very much coming down to people wanting to communicate with influencers communicate with individuals talk to individuals and um it's only going to get i think more fragmented um it's also going to be driven by by computer systems and artificial intelligence Thank you. Thank you for this uh, for this advice, you know, and sharing your insights about this, answering my question. Um, maybe you can also speak a bit about fundraising, because I believe a lot of our uh, listeners or viewers, they're interested, you know, in funding a company, especially a startup, or if they are already in the scale up phase, they're also looking for investors. So maybe you have an advice for those people. Absolutely. Absolutely. You've got to get your proposition right. You've got to get your presentation, your proposition right. So investors want to understand what's the basic idea. You've got about 10 minutes maximum to convince an investor. It used to be you had a one hour meeting or a two hour meeting, but it's now 10 minutes. So you've got to have a clear vision on your idea and you've got to broken down what the key points are. And then you've got to say, who's, where's the money going to come from? You've got to be very clear on what your costs are going to be. So it's it's got to be simple, straightforward, simple. You know, we, we have a list of things that should be in a presentation. And then you've got to target the right investors. Um, so that involves spending a bit of money. I mean, we use mostly PitchBook. And by using PitchBook or Crunchbase or one of the other resources, one you've got to pay for them. You don't you don't get anything for free in life. Uh, but when you get that, you can actually at least identify the likely investors. So we use this for geothermal. You know, we can see companies that have already invested in geothermal, or companies that have invested in, say, solar parks. You know, geothermal is renewable energy. It, it, there's three. There's geothermal, wind, mm -hmm. and solar. So if they've invested in wind or they've invested in solar, they might invest in geothermal. So you've got to do your research. You've got to have a very clear proposition. And you've then got to research. Uh, you rehearse. You've got to rehearse. Even a day rehearsing will save you a lot of trouble. Now, here in Monaco, there's a, a team that I've just convinced to actually start using me. Um, they run monthly investment opportunity meetings. They, they hire a local hotel. It's not fair to say which one. Uh, they'll have some project. Um, and the, the, the person with the project comes to Monaco. And at 6.30, you get free wine for 50 people and canapes. And they get up and present. The majority of those presentations are complete failures um, because they just, there's no rehearsal, there's no clarity, they, it's not clear that they've ever actually presented to 50 or 60 people before. Um, I'll give you a couple of little examples. Uh, one presentation, the gentleman involved was putting up on the slide his business plan and his Excel spreadsheets. Well, there's 50 people in a room Even the people at the front couldn't see any of the figures. Then uh, another example would be if you do some basic rehearsal uh, with people, I asked them right at the beginning, when you were little, when you were three or four, did you believe in magic? And, you know, if they've got a sense of humor, they say yes. And I say, well, I'm going to tell you, for pres presenting, you've, you've got to believe in magic again. Because you've got your laptop there and you've got the screen behind you. And I guarantee you the magic is whatever's on the screen is going to be behind you if we set it up properly. Because so many presentations of people who don't know what they're doing, they, 
They don't talk to the audience. You know, what they fail is you've got to have eye contact. You need to be looking at the different people around the room and you need to slow down because often, you know, if you don't present every day, you're nervous, you speed up. So whenever I do speeches, I always tell myself in the last 10 seconds, slow. Because, you know, sometimes there's a thousand people there. And um, and very often, in, in my case, it's been in different countries. I did a major presentation in China, or Macau, actually, with all the top uh, retail business people in China. And you've got to go slow as well, because it's their second or third language, or they're listening to the translation, so you've got to leave time for the translator. But all these things can be rehearsed, and you can, in a, in a few hours, you can make somebody a lot better. But people don't rehearse. They, they fly all the way over. They think they just got a great idea. They're going to get lots of checks or bank transfers. And it just doesn't happen. You've got to build an impression. You've got to get the impression across that you know what you're talking about. You've got a good business idea. You understand where your customers are. You understand your competitors. You know, and, and you, you can say why you're better than your competitors. So maybe that helps. A few Thank minutes. You. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Craig. So I could talk with you for hours, really. I mean, it's so impressive. All the insights you are sharing. Of course, sometimes it's also about the simple things, right? I mean, I don't know if it's um, simple to be aware of that you should talk to the people in front of you and not, you know, show your back, something like this. But uh, yeah, sometimes um, the most obvious things are maybe the most um, complex ones. Well, it's not just that you need to talk to people in front of you you've got to move you've got to look at different people because they've come at least for the first two or three minutes to listen to you so you, you you've actually got to look at everybody and try and engage everybody if you look at people they'll listen longer if you're losing them they get the phone out and start making arrangements for lunch yes <laughs> you're right <laughs> So it was really magical to speak with you today, Greg. So I'm so thankful that you uh, spent uh, this time with me, you know, talking about your background and also sharing a lot of insights. I would like, you know, just to say that this is now wrapping up our enlightening episode of today's Mentor Talk. It was a really, really big pleasure. Thank you so much um, for your time. Uh, I hope you will have a wonderful day uh, today in Monaco. And I would like to close um, our uh, episode today with uh, some insightful words as well. So I believe success is a journey, as uh, Greg just presented, and having the guidance and also the wisdom of an experienced professional um, makes all the difference. So and um, if you have any kind of feedback or if you would like to get support by today's expert, uh, Gregory Tain, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Greg, I'm sorry again. <laughs> Yeah, uh, just uh, email me uh, to uh, mentor at uh, salespro4u.com um, and uh, I wish you a wonderful day. Um, thank you so much. Bye-bye, Greg. Thank you. Have a good Bye. day.